everyone should mobilize for the 20th and the 20th of September because this is a global issue which actually affects everyone. There, I've got one, a one word answer, a really simple word answer for why Connecticut keeps expanding frack methane despite knowing that it's destroying our climate and hurting people. It's corruption. Connecticut has a problem with corruption. Yeah. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. Sweden's Greta Thunberg helped fire up a youthful climate movement. Here's a video about the upcoming September 20th global climate strike. We are the younger generation. We are the ones who are going to be affected and therefore we demand justice. What do we want? Climate justice! What do we want? Everyone should mobilize for the 20th and the 20th of September because this is a global issue which actually affects everyone. We are all in the same boat, so everyone should be concerned about this. Me movilizo porque somos un movimiento mundial. I'm striking because if we don't fight for our future now, soon we won't have a future left to fight for. Je soutiens aussi la grève des enfants pour que les décideurs du climat puissent appuyer pour que l'avenir soit radieux pour nous tous. Je vais participer à la grève pour le climat le 20 de septembre de 2019 parce que je crois que c'est notre responsabilité de cuidar de notre maison. Et nous sommes avec les jeunes qui ont pris une stance aujourd'hui et qui ont pris leur voix pour pouvoir avoir un réel impact. Jeg synes, det er vigtigt, at være med i de globale klimastrækker i september. Fordi det her det kan være den sidste chance, vi har for politikerne op til at handle på klimakrisen. I'm joining the strikes because I believe it's time to resist and to take charge of the future that belongs to us. We stand with Greta and all those fighting for our future. We need you to be a part of it because we need every age involved. Young people have been leading here, but now it's the job of the rest of us to back them up. This shouldn't be the children's responsibility because now the adults also need to help us. So we are calling for them to strike from their work because we need everyone. There is nothing we can't do. And I mean, if not you should do it, then who else? And if, if not we should do it now, then when, sh when should we do it? Senna Weiser of the Sunrise Movement will talk about what will happen in Connecticut. So, Senna, I understand you're very active in what's coming up on, uh, in a month or so from now, in September, uh, climate mobilization in Connecticut. What's going on? Yeah, so on September 20th, there's going to be a global climate strike. So here in Connecticut, we are planning our own. Um, so on that day, we need all youth, we need adults, we need um, unions, we need marginalized communities, we need everybody to come out and to show up and to say that we demand climate action now from all of our leaders. So you say strike, you're hoping people will stop their normal activities? Yeah, so uh, skip school if you're in school, skip work, um, and come here and strike together at the Capitol. You think the, seri the situation is that serious? Yeah, so I mean, we know we have 12 years. Um, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they released a report saying that we have 12 years to stop climate change. And 2020 is our last chance to have a president in the White House who can actually do something about climate change. So yeah, it's time to stop our normal routine and to demand that we have action now because we can't wait any longer. Are any demonstrations planned for the 20th? Yeah, so there will, there's going to be um, a strike at the Capitol here in Hartford um, where everybody will hopefully come out and strike with us. All right, we'll look for more details later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I interviewed Wazer at a demonstration in Hartford, Connecticut against the building of a second climate-destroying methane-burning power plant in Killingly, Connecticut. 
Martha Klein of the Sierra Club led the demonstration in front of the DEEP building. It stands for the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. It's common sense. So I want to talk about uh, what's been going on for the last six years. For the last six years, I have been fighting the frack gas expansion in Connecticut. And the reason that we're here meeting in front of the Department of Energy or DEEP office is because DEEP was in part an architect of the frack gas expansion in Connecticut going back to the 2013 Comprehensive Energy Strategy. Now, DEEP, to, to give them a little bit of credit, um, they want more frack gas because they believe that frack gas is better than coal or oil. And so I don't want to slam them without acknowledging that um, in, in their hearts they believe that they're doing the right thing. But now I'm going to speak from my heart. One question I keep getting over the last six years is why, if we already know factually, we have the science, we already know that burning fracked methane, or natural gas, which is its euphemistic name, if burning fracked methane creates more global warming greenhouse gas emissions than burning coal or oil, which it does as long as you include all the methane emissions from the point of fracking to the point of burning. If we know factually that it's worse, which we know, how can the Connecticut government and Connecticut agencies be approving a frack gas expansion? And this is a question that I get all the time. And for the last six years, I have struggled to answer that question. I have said they don't understand. They just don't know. And you know, then I keep meeting them. And I'm always impressed because they're super smart and they're super thoughtful. So there, I've got one, a one word answer, a really simple word answer for why Connecticut keeps expanding fracked methane despite knowing that it's destroying our climate and hurting people. It's corruption. Connecticut has a problem with corruption. Yeah, it does. And it's sad to say we have a history. We've had Republican governors go to jail. We've had Democratic mayors go to jail. This is equal opportunity as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to call out any political party, okay? This covers everything. And right now, at numerous Connecticut agencies at our top level of government, whether we're talking about the Green Bank, we're talking about the lottery, we're talking about other agencies, all of these agencies are being investigated for corruption because there's so much corruption in our state. And part of the corruption is that our government and our, our uh, non-elected agencies are making policies to expand frack methane, which worsens the climate, it exacerbates climate change, it makes us sicker because there's more air pollution, that increases mortality and morbidity, especially among children. So what I'm telling you here is that these plans that are made by Connecticut agencies are literally killing children, and the more power plants they open, they're gonna kill more children. And so what I'm gonna tell you now is that the next time people ask me, why is this happening? The answer, the only answer, the only honest answer I can give is corruption. And the other thing I'm gonna say is that it's murder. When you approve frack gas infrastructure, pipelines, power plants, compressor stations, and you know from the scientific research that more children will die, but you keep approving these plants when you have alternatives, because of course we have the alternatives already in place, then you're a murderer. I think that it's reasonable for us to start using those words. We have alternatives. Connecticut already approved thousands of megawatts of offshore wind power. It's going to come online about the same time as this frack gas power plant. It is almost certain that this frack gas power plant will not ever actually run, or if it does, it will be for a very short time. Let's remember all the different infrastructure that goes into this power plant. They're going to build a brand new 2.3 mile massive pipeline to cart that uh, frack methane from the Enbridge line. Enbridge of Native American tribe destruction. Let's remember who they are. Uh, the Dapple pipeline is um, owned by Enbridge. They're going to build a brand new pipeline, 2.3 miles, owned by Eversource. And it's going through Wyndham Land Trust land. That's why Wyndham Land Trust was one of the interveners against this project, along with Sierra Club. 
Um, that means ripping up virgin to areas, virgin land, to put in new pipeline, and that land never, ever reverts to its virgin state ever again. The land becomes permanently uh, compacted and it's changed hydrologically forever. They're going to bring in more gas. That means more um, emissions that come from the pipeline, the brand new pipeline that gets built. And I can promise you right now that DEEP will approve a 2.3 mile pipeline for Eversource. And how can I say that? Because I've been doing this for six years. And DEEP, the corrupt murderers, that's right, that's what I'm calling them now. I changed my polite tone. <laughs> the corrupt murderers will approve that pipeline because in six years that I have dedicated my life, my every waking moment to fighting this, there is not one fracked gas project that Deep has ever, forget even, refused, that has even ever questioned every compressor station that's been applied for, every new pipeline, every power plant, Deep has approved it. And why? Because Deep is the architect of the frack gas expansion in Connecticut. We don't need it. It's murdering us and it's destroying our climate. How much is enough, Deep? How no much more. is enough, no Deep? More. No, more. no more. So let's chant. Um, Katie Dykes, we don't want her, we don't have, she's got to go. How do we say that? Um, um, Frack gas pipe, pipe gas power plants. Hey, hey, ho, ho! Frack gas power plants have got to go! Hey, hey, ho, ho! Frack gas power plants have got to go! Hey, hey, ho, ho! Frack gas power plants have got to go! Hey, hey, ho, ho! Frack gas... Protesters had a short march and then assembled in a park across the street from Deep. I interviewed three women from the Killingly area. When our community's lungs are over an attack, what do we do? Stand up! Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. When our community's lungs are under attack, what do we do? Stand up! We're from northeastern Connecticut. Yay. The quiet corner isn't quiet. So what is your group and why are you here today? We are trying to get people sitting yeah. engaged in their government. What's the name of your group? The Quiet Corner Shouts with exclamation point. We fight for the environment, uh, voters' rights, uh, social issues, um, environmental issues, yeah. and justice. And justice. Yeah. Justice for all. And what are the things that you don't like about this proposed plan? Oh, it'll mess oh. up the environment. We don't need one. It'll mess up the environment. We have wind power coming on offshore very soon. Um, it, it's just a total mess. And Governor Lamont said he would run on clean energy. This is not clean energy. So we can't afford it. Killingly is a beautiful town and they're just exploiting it. I understand there's other power plants in the area. Yeah, well, there's another one right next to where this one is going up. Supposedly, we don't want this other one to go up. And one of the re several reasons is it's going to add to the to the um, heat in the atmosphere, adding to uh, uh, pushing forward the climate change, whether people want to recognize it as a real reality. It is the truth, a scientific truth that's happening. Also, this plant will take in water from the Quinnebog River and to help cool off things and whatnot, so therefore there'll be water that's contaminated from this plant. And the other thing is, they're using frack gas that they're going to be shipping into that our part of the state. And in order to transport that frack gas, they have to take the pipes that already exist for the Algonquin pipeline and widen them to, uh, to accommodate this gas, which has, you know, it's, it's, it, because of its chemical um, composition, it, 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 it has more, it takes more space up in a pipe. So therefore, um, in regards to expanding pipes, construction on pipes, and there was a workshop several years ago by this company called Spectra, Spectra I think, they may have changed their name, but they're the same people providing this gas. 
and what they said in their presentation, they didn't speak about it. They had it all printed out. You had to read it or go home and read it online, which I did. I read their pamphlet online. So if they don't have enough space for all this gas once the Algonquin line gets uh, made to accommodate it, they have the power to take over property by eminent domain to put storage tanks on underground in people's property. This could possibly affect places with wide open space like the um, Audubon and Wyndham Land Trust. We're not certain, but we've heard some kind of rumors in the back of our mind that those areas are being targeted for possible land that they may need to, uh, to store this, uh, this gas. And we don't need this, this power plant. We have ac adequate power, power where we live. This is just going to be shipped off elsewhere, like when the Alaskan pipeline got built. That gas from the Alaskan pipeline was sold to Japan. It was brought forth as a, an idea that, oh, this is going to help the, the Americans get through the, uh, the crisis with energy. But it never did anything to benefit the, uh, the uh, Americans. All it did was make profit for the, um, the companies that sell gas and produce power. So that's a good reason why we oppose it, but primarily for the pollution and the harm to the environment. The environment has to come before profits. It has to come before people. Without a safe, clean earth, we don't exist. And what is the sentiment in the towns? I mean, what about political leaders? Did they oh, go along with it? Well, <laughs> that's a long story. I can't say for certain. I've been to many meetings of uh, the town council of Killingly and where uh, the signing council has been. This was going on several years ago. The feeling is that Killingly wanted this plant. They want it to, um, I could be wrong, you'll have to check that, but the feeling was going on into this, they welcomed it to help with the tax base, yep. to bring money, people money. in to work on this plant for several years, or who knows, people may want to relocate to work on this plant. But once the plant is built, the environment, all, everybody in the surrounding towns, people up in Massachusetts, people all over, are going to breathe this air. It do, the air doesn't just belong to the Killingly and the Killingly Council who said, let's bring this in for business. The air belongs to all of us. And Northeastern Connecticut has the highest rate of asthma in the state of All Connecticut. Right. You can look it up. And I'm a former nurse, I'm a retired nurse, and I'll tell you, there's nothing sadder than seeing children and adults suffer to try to breathe due to environmental hazards that we put out in the earth. So. Who did you say has the highest, what part of the state has the highest rate? Northeastern Connecticut has the highest rate of upper respiratory problems such as asthma. It's been documented. New Haven has also claimed that, documented. So. Wow, you know, it's almost like when people uh, um, experience a tragedy and there's like a, a tug of war to say, me, me, up my... So let's put, it, yeah, let's put it this way. It's horrible. Whoever has to experience it. You mentioned Massachusetts just a year or two ago there was explosions yes. in three towns yes. in gas. Yes. And this, these, these people at one of their meetings, because I've been to several of the town hall meetings and whatnot and uh, about this plant, and they're saying, oh, that they've got all these safety nets involved, and, you know, that there won't be an explosion, there won't be a, this and that. But, you know, that's what they said when they built Three Mile Island. That's what they said when they built Fukushima. And I'll tell you a story about Fukushima. I have a friend who's passed away. She was a nuclear physicist. And it was said at her funeral by her rabbi. This is an honest, true story. She was over to Fukushima as a consultant before they even built the plant. She offered some suggestions to help make that plant sit safer. They totally ignored her. Desmond, tell us about CHISPA and why it's here today. Yes, uh, so uh, CHISPA is the uh, educational uh, organizing branch of the Connecticut uh, League for Conservation Voters. Uh, we look at how environmental um, issues affect pe communities and people of color disproportionately. No, uh, we look to provide uh, education. Uh, we want clean air. Uh, we want, you know, everything that the other people want for, you know, for their lives and society. You know, again, clean air, uh, clean energy. Uh, we want to see uh, the environment turned around, and we believe that we do that through education and reaching out to those who are disproportionately affected by climate change, uh, like, you know, again, communities of color, you know, people, black and brown people. So when you talk about uh, minorities, um, 
Killingly may not be the one closest to minority populations, but they're building another methane plant in Bridgeport. Correct. And uh, how do you feel about that plant? Uh, we, uh, again, uh, we feel the, the plant in Bridgeport uh, and the plant in Killingly are the same type of evil. They're just different geographic locations. Um, this world is interconnected. Uh, the waste that gets generated in Rhode Island is very easily breathed right here in Connecticut. So to say that uh, the Killingly plant would be isolated from uh, the urban uh, communities uh, is just a falsehood and a misconception. Uh, the, the earth is interconnected, so we must shut down all of these uh, toxic producers, uh, the ones in Killingly, as well as the ones in Bridgeport. Um, again, uh, studies show that you know the urban uh, the, the urban folks who live in these areas, like Bridgeport and New Haven and Hartford, uh, they do suffer with higher rates of asthma uh, than those that live in the suburb. But again, uh, methane is one of those greenhouse gases uh, which uh, dramatically uh, affects climate change and uh, basically climate issues. So whether again it's in Killingly or in Bridgeport, we want all frack gas, all dirty power uh, to stop here in Connecticut. We need a um, divestment from dirty energy like coal, uh, gas, and frack gas uh, to switch to clean energy, um, renewable, tidal power, wind power, geothermal. Uh, those are the things that are going to get us through to the next generation. We have seven videos of the rally. Go to our website and then click on this button to get to our YouTube channel to see them all. Representative Ro Khanna of California says he has a way to end the Saudi-U.S. onslaught of Yemen. He will offer an amendment to the National Defense Act barring the sale of parts to the Saudi Air Force. He says that if Congress passes this amendment, the president cannot politically veto it because he would be then vetoing the entire budget for the U.S. military. Sounds worth trying. Senator Bernie Sanders is in support. Worth a phone call to Congress, to your representatives and members of the Senate. If you don't know how to reach them, use this number to reach Congress. On July 31st, Ahmad Sa'ad Dawabshah celebrated his ninth birthday. His mother, father, and baby sister were burned to death in 2015 by two Israeli settlers, one a minor. The minor pleaded guilty to arson in May and is expected to go free within five years. The adult suspect, Amiram ben Oliel, is under arrest, but despite having confessed, has not been put on trial. This after four years. Imagine if it had been the other way around and Palestinians had been suspected of this horrendous crime. If they hadn't been shot on sight, their homes would have been demolished immediately and sentence would have been levied within months. Michael Brown was shot to death by a policeman in Ferguson, Missouri five years ago. It's said that a prosecutor could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. But the prosecutor in Ferguson was unable to get an indictment. So the policeman who shot Michael Brown was never charged and never stood trial. However, there is a new prosecutor in town and Michael Brown Sr. is asking for a new investigation. From Democracy Now!, this awful story. 
A 41-year-old man from Detroit, Michigan, was found dead in Baghdad Tuesday, just two months after U.S. authorities deported him to Iraq. Jimmy al Daoud, an Iraqi national who was brought to the U.S. as an infant, was deported in June as part of the Trump administration's crackdown on immigrants from Iraq and other Muslim-majority countries. A friend said al Daoud's death was likely due to his inability to obtain insulin to treat his diabetes. Aldoud struggled with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He had no family or friends in Iraq. He did not speak Arabic. He was born in Greece and came to the U.S. when he was six months old. In a video posted to Facebook from Baghdad before his death, Aldoud said he pleaded with ICE agents not to deport him. I begged them. I said, please, I've never seen that country. I've never been there. However, they forced me. I'm here now. And, and I don't understand the language, anything. I've been sleeping in the street. I'm diabetic. I take insulin shots. I've been throwing up, throwing up, sleeping in the street, trying to find something to eat. Al Daoud was from a minority Christian community that's been severely persecuted in Iraq. An attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union representing Iraqi immigrants said, quote, Jimmy's death has devastated his family and us. We knew he would not survive if deported. What we don't know is how many more people ICE will send to their deaths, unquote. In Yemen, the Saudi and UAE royals had a falling out and their proxy troops are slaughtering each other. But in Yemen, not everything is awful. Kids will be kids. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.